Oh, there we go. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. I didn't know Chainstack people could join straight from the straight through the waiting room. Nice. Okay, let me put my headphones in since we're getting to time right now. Hey Matt, just wanted to say I can hear you. Audio's coming in loud and clear. Sweet. <laughs> All right, let me just switch my speakers over real quick and make sure we're good to go here. Cool, guys, can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome, okay, good. And Matt, I think to confirm this, this session is being recorded, right? Yeah, it is currently being recorded to my machine. Cool. We'll let the waiting room build up just a little bit here. We'll let uh, David get into whenever he joins. Okay, I guess no one has entered the now. I have a I have a waiting room right now, so we have uh, twelve people in the waiting room. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, <clears throat> but. Yeah, we'll definitely do a sync. Put some time on everyone's calendar. With if if you're cool with the same time tomorrow, nine a.m. Um, I want to do like a recap meeting too, just so we can all get aligned on the whatever the results are today. Yeah, that works. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna give it. Um, I'm gonna admit everyone right now, and we'll wait for anyone else to join. Awesome. Hey, welcome in, guys. Hello, hello. Cool. Um, it is awesome to have everyone here. We're going to give it a couple more minutes while everyone still connects, but uh, yeah, looking forward to this. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's maybe wait like five minutes while we wait for people to slowly pour in. Um, I don't know if there's a way you can turn off letting everybody in manually so they can just join and you don't need to accept everyone individually let me see there might be a way um yeah i can turn it off there we go perfect yeah it is happy new year everyone <laughs> it's just the beginning so we'll see how <laughs> many people are available today but um you guys are yeah. the real ones you're the ones that are uh <laughs> Taking it off day one, ready to go. <laughs> new year, new framework, bro. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. How was your uh, new year, Hardik? Um, so far, so good, man. Um, just need to do this, and then I'm off to packing. I'm flying tomorrow, um, so just need to pack and get ready for that. Crypto related, or are you just going and taking a trip? Uh, more like visa issues related <laughs> oh geez i'm sorry <laughs> um yeah i i'm right now packing everything up too because i'm getting ready i'm going to singapore in a month for polygon at the pit uh so i'm getting nice. all that stuff together nice 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 that's awesome yeah. mm -hmm. um cool so discord takes about a few minutes to let everybody know the event has started it's just slow for some reason so yeah no, um, no worries yeah we're probably gonna have to wait a few more minutes before everybody actually joins yeah um yeah everybody i hope you had a good new year um let's do this while we're waiting if you guys are comfortable sharing uh 
throw in chat what's one thing you want to learn uh, in Web3 in the new year. If, I mean, obviously, I hope Foundry is number one, but <laughs> throw something out. Hmm. I'm trying to learn, uh, I mean, in addition to Foundry, uh, Polygon ZK EVM is my next big one. Oh, yeah. Lens. Nice. Yeah, I Poly was... Uh, course on Learn Web 3 soon. Almost I saw done. that. That looks <laughs> sick. Yeah, I'll, I'll be one of the first people in there um, once you guys open it up. <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. ZK EVM, I think, like, um, what do I want to learn this year? Hmm. I want to get into Cosmos, actually. I want to check out the Cosmos ecosystem a bit more. Totally. Um, I Honestly, I need to do Cosmos, too. I'm really interested in Secret Network, and they're based off the Cosmos SDK. So I need to do a little diving in and see what I can learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems all of California is hyped on Cosmos now. Uh, <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> what? Why California? <laughs> Um, I don't know, UC Berkeley and Stanford are kind of pushing for Cosmos a lot recently. Oh, okay. Um, Berkeley because a, a lot of their Interesting. early people who formed like the UC Berkeley blockchain club is one of the first blockchain clubs in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And people at Stanford, like a lot of them kind of moved on from Ethereum to Cosmos, like not moved on, but like experimented in both, like the founder, original founder of UC Berkeley Blockchain Club built the Osmosis Dex on Cosmos. Gotcha. Um, so like, you know, it got hyped in the Berkeley Club and mm -hmm. a bunch of Berkeley folks went on to do um, Cosmos apps and stuff as well. And just reading their roadmap, it looks like we're at a point where Ethereum's future roadmap overlaps a little bit with what Cosmos has already built and Cosmos's future roadmap overlaps a little bit with what Ethereum has already built. So it seems like see the that. Are converging towards mm -hmm. like a single future. Um, cool. So yeah. I don't know. Nice. Yeah, I'll check it out. That sounds interesting. I was uh, I was talking to the Optimism founder the other day and he was getting me super bullish on the app chains that they're putting out. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with like Bedrock or anything. But uh, oh, yeah, yeah, they're uh, pretty bullish. I mean, he's the founder, so he should be the most. But it was uh, it was a pretty interesting call. Uh, anyways, let's see. It's nine oh five. Should we give it a couple, like maybe one or two more minutes and get going? Um, hmm. Maybe let's wait. Yeah, maybe let's wait for another couple minutes. Let's go at like nine oh eight or twelve oh eight, nine oh eight. Yeah. Yes. Sounds good. Yeah, happy though for everybody who's in here right now. Um, yeah, IBC looks really interesting. I know because bridging is like the biggest, the biggest handicap right now to this like multi-chain idea we got. I mean, we were just, I was in a space a couple of days ago talking about it, and it, the fact that right now like most bridges that we know of are basically just vaults that when someone cracks, like could steal all the funds out of. It's not not sustainable. <laughs> I'll be like a lot of these DSO apps these days, like Lens at all, um, will eventually need to move to an app chain of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not sustainable. I know like Lens has a bunch of money from Polygon right now to cover gas costs and stuff, but like in the long run, they can't rely on Polygon grants, right? At least that's my understanding. They have to do like an app chain of some sort. Yeah, I'm thinking they might. I, I'm sure Polygon's trying to get them on to like Polygon Edge or like Supernets or something like that. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I, I forget about that. Oh, it feels like I rarely hear that name. They're um, building it out. It's just it, it's been delayed so much. So I think that's part of the reason why it gets held up. Mm, makes sense. Oh, ZK Rollup app chains. Yeah, that's that's a good contender as well. Um, yeah hopefully 23 is the year of good like mature zk chains finally that'd be awesome <laughs> that'd be a great start to the year <laughs> um yeah uh what else <laughs> avalanche uh, is doing something similar hmm. it's like subnets yeah. or 
I don't know, this blog post. So Avalanche warp messaging subnet to subnet messages. Mm, That's cool. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah, Avalanche just put out their uh, their ZK SDK, if you saw that. Really? I don't really follow Avalanche that much, to be honest. Um, yeah, one of our DevRels oh. covers Avalanche, and he was giving me just some alpha and was showing, uh, I guess they released like some ZK tooling. So it looks pretty interesting, honestly. I mean, Avalanche is killing it at the moment. Hmm. Interesting. Custom virtual machines are insane. Yeah, I think Cosmos already had that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think the main reason for me is really just, I welcome sort of the different ideas around Cosmos in comparison to sort of EVM forks with a few modifications. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, not to say that Avalanche doesn't have good ideas or other chains don't have good ideas, but I feel like Cosmos is just built different from the start. Mm -hmm. Well, the cool thing is you can use Foundry on whatever chain you pick. Um, so I think we're going to, should we just jump in? I think we've got enough time yeah. on the on the board. Uh, well, cool. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Happy New Year. Uh, super excited to be doing this. Thank you, Hardik, again, for letting Chainstack come and do this workshop. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're really excited to be here and just show you guys everything there is with Foundry. Uh, our team put in a ton of work to get this done, so they... Are, are killing it right now. Um, we're super excited about Foundry. So getting into it a little bit, um, let's jump right in and just meet the team, all right? So, hey, my name is Matt. Um, I am a head of DevRel for Chainstack. Uh, I'm also the head of Polygon. So that's why I'm talking so much about Polygon ZK EVM. If you ever have any Polygon related questions, hit me up. I'll try my best to help you. Uh, but yeah, Fun fact about me, I actually did learn Web3 DAO back in the day. So I've done everything from freshman through senior. I'll definitely be hopping on to some of those added modules too about Polygon ID and ZK EVM. So I'm definitely looking forward to those. But uh, I totally get where you guys are coming from as new students. So if you guys ever have any questions about, you know, getting into Web3 or trying to find like your niche, just let me know. So that's my intro. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it over to Priyank and the rest of the team. Okay. So am I audible, guys? Yeah, good to go. Cool, man. So I'm assuming you'll still be presenting a part of the presentation, Matthew, still? Yeah, and then I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, cool. So hey, guys, welcome to this workshop. My name is Priyank, and I'm a dev advocate at Chainstack. I'll be taking you through the majority of this workshop today. And I put in a ton of work into building this workshop and I hope you have a great time and I hope you take something good back home today. And again, welcome. This is the second day of the new year and I hope this goes well for you. Passing it over to David. Hi everyone, my name is David and I'm a developer advocate at Chainstack as well. And uh, yes, Priyank put a lot of work into this, so this is going to be amazing. And I'm just going to be here mostly to uh, answer questions in the chat and uh, just have a little bit of support for my fellow dev advocate here. And uh, Nick is next. Yeah, hey folks, thank you so much. My name is Nick Sachagray. I'm the head of DeFi with Chainstack. I'm a colleague of all the, the fine gentlemen on the phone here today. And i uh, thrilled to be part of this endeavor together with Learn Web 3. Uh, and obviously, if anybody's interested in talking anything about Chainstack plans, any of the product solution sets that we have, I'm here to help. And uh, definitely, you know, big supporter of, of what the, the team has put together here and of the Learn Web 3 community. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So yeah, moving forward a little bit, uh, I want to walk you guys through kind of what our project goals are for today. So for those of you guys who are unaware, we're using Foundry. Uh, part of the project today, we're going to focus on using Chainstack. We're a Web3 infrastructure provider. So we'll be using Chainstack to create and run some high-performing RPC nodes, just being able to connect and deploy your app to the chain. Uh, we're going to be using Foundry's tools, Forge and Cast specifically, uh, and Priyank will go into a little more detail about what those actually are to write and test our smart contracts. And then finally, we're going to push all of our changes to the contract to the Gurley testnet and deploy on Ethereum. So yeah, general project overview for you guys. Uh, looking forward to it. So with that, let's get in a little bit more detail. 
So for those of you guys who have never installed Foundry before on your computer or are completely brand new to it, I wanted to throw out really, really quick, um, just a quick guide on getting Foundry installed. If you've never installed it, go ahead right now, pull up your terminal and go ahead and copy and paste, or we just can't copy, but we'll put that in the chat for you really quick. Um, this following command just to get started with installing Foundry. Uh, this is specifically for Linux and Mac users. So if you're not on Linux or Mac, uh, go ahead and follow along with what Priyank and David are putting in the chat. This is a GitHub repo with a direct guide to what we're doing. Um, it'll give you a bit of a walkthrough through everything else. Or if you're having trouble with that, I really recommend looking up Foundry Book. And Foundry Book will give you a, oh, yeah, you got an extra hyphen at the end of that, uh, that link, Priyank. Um, but yeah, if you run into any troubles with the installation process, okay, Foundry let me Book, check that. Yeah, Foundry Book will give you a, a good overview of just installing the actual repo itself. Right now, I'm putting in the chat um, this command here. Um, we got curl and then Foundry up. We'll give it like one or two minutes just for you guys to be sure you got everything installed. If everyone is good, put a thumbs up in the chat. Uh, if you're having trouble, send a message. David, Priyank, and I will try and sort things out for you. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, Matthew, I'll have to cut you in. So guys, I think I know what the problem is. So if you click that link, what what's happening here is the browser is taking out the hyphen at the end. So like if it's showing you 404, uh, just add an extra hyphen at the end of the address and it should open right up. Good save. Yeah, um, I you will... got somebody in the Discord who said that they are getting an installation error with Foundry connection timed out. Um, that sounds like an internet issue to me, but if you're facing that, I recommend just following along with the GitHub link, likely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, apologies that happens, guys. If you're having trouble following along for whatever reason, um, again, we'll have the GitHub repo so you can follow later, kind of like a Learn Web 3 tutorial. But for now, if you do want to stay tuned and just kind of watch and use this as a guide to kind of seeing how you'd walk through it, we'll have a recording of this available too, where we'll upload afterwards and if you can't do it live with us, you can definitely do it step by step afterwards. But this will just be a good intro to to kind of the value for Rust and uh, and Foundry. So yeah, we'll give it a couple more minutes here. I think at uh, nine eighteen my time, I will go ahead and move forward. We already have a couple of questions, so can I take this time to answer those while people install? Sure. Okay, so at the rate hate test asks us how the fuzzing test. Yeah, we'll look into fuzz testing as well at the end of the workshop. So that's cool. Is this for PC only or mobile ready? I do not know what that means. If you're trying to code on mobile, you're already light years ahead of me, dude. Uh, I don't know if it works on a mobile. Okay, foundry available via NPM. No, it's a Rust based GitHub repo, you have to install it either from the source directly from the GitHub repo, or you have to use the curl command and everything like the curl uh, installation by the curl command is list uh, detailed in the readme of the GitHub repo and, and written, yeah, not available on NPM. Could you send a, send the windows link please? Okay. So what I've done is in the installation instructions, I, have linked the windows thing yeah uh, right at the top uh, under the section installing foundry if you need to in install it on windows you need to build from source and it'll take a bit of time but you can go to the link directly from the readme foundry docs yeah i've linked it in the readme a bunch of times foundry docs windows installation guide thank you hard dick anything else okay so a hyphen yeah uh, Ahmed, you need to put a hyphen. For some reason, the browser is taking out the hyphen at the end. <laughs> I don't know what that error is. Okay. So we'll wait a couple more minutes. 
to hopefully okay worked <laughs> okay so matthew what do you think should we wait a couple of minutes to give people time to install everything yeah if you guys are doing good um if foundry up ran for you then just put a thumbs up in the chat if you're having trouble still um put a thumbs yeah, down feel free to so basically foundry up should run and okay it's all small letters right which shows everything in caps installed oh. cool yeah that is that is on me i <laughs> For next time, I will not put all of the code in all caps. Uh, syntax be like. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, just. That's tough. Yeah. And, and again, guys, um, don't feel pressured at all if you're having trouble getting this to work live. Obviously, we'd love for you to code live with us. But if you're having any troubles, again, it's going to be recorded. We'll walk you through everything. And the readme is there for you, too. Yeah, absolutely the readme should be good enough for later on okay for docker folks yeah thank you Oknesis. I yeah, don't also use... this meeting is being recorded so you know you'll be able to watch this on youtube later as well if you miss a step or something a hundred yeah a hundred percent cool um i think if everyone's good um we'll get going yeah. here then uh, so before we get into the code, we're going to have Priyank give you guys just an overview of, you know, why we care about Foundry, because like, why do we care? <laughs> um, obviously, I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with Hard Hat from the Learn Web 3 tutorials. But yeah, with that, I'm actually going to switch off screen sharing here to Priyank and let you guys hear directly from him. So yeah, let me just get uh, the security. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Matthew. Let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, I have a bunch of things open. Okay, is my screen visible, guys? Yep, it's up for us. Yep. Uh, let me just clear, clear out the extra tabs. For now, we don't need this. Okay. Yeah, cool. So I'll take over from here. So a couple of things, you know, so every time there's a new framework out there, it's a very good question to ask, like, why should we even bother learning that? You know, because we already have a bunch of things that work and it requires a little more effort to learn new things. So it's always good to know why we are even bothering. So coming to Foundry, Foundry has a bunch of things that it does differently from its predecessors, specifically Truffle and Hard Act. So the first thing that like most famous about Foundry is you can write tests uh, in Foundry using Solidity instead of JavaScript or TypeScript. So if you're not familiar with either of those languages, you can still do everything expected of a Solidity developer using Foundry. And secondly, uh, Foundry natively supports something called fuzzing. Now fuzzing isn't native to blockchain. Uh, when we mean fuzz testing, First mm -hmm. testing basically means you pass a bunch of arbitrary parameters to your function to get it to fail, right? So to give an example, say you have a function that takes an integer as a parameter, anything, one, two, three, four, five, six. So what you do is you write a unit test and you give it a parameter one or a two, but you don't know if it'll pass or fail for the number hundred. And just to be sure you want to run that test a bunch of times, right? So what fuzzing allows you to do is you give a parameter to the function and it will run uh, that function within some within, within a valid set of parameters a bunch of times so uh, the testing overall will be a bit more comprehensive and you can be a little more secure in your function and thirdly one thing that i've noticed with foundry is that fun uh, all your contracts they compile faster the tests uh, run faster as compared to hard hat or truffle, so that's always a plus point. But mainly from a DevX perspective, the first two, two things are the ones that mattered the most. Writing tests in solidity and uh, be like be allowed to have first testing. Now, as far as I'm aware, there are tools already that support first testing, but hard hat does not have first testing. And something, I think there's th this thing called Echidna, ECH, IDNA. It also has first testing, but I've never used it, so I won't comment. 
Okay, so hopefully you had Foundry installed by now. See, when you install Foundry, you basically get access to three different CLI tools. So it's divided into three things. Forge, Forge is what we use to initialize a Foundry project, compile our smart contracts, enable testing, and deploying our smart contracts. Okay, so Cast, Cast is kind of independent. You don't even need a Foundry project to use Cast. What Cast does is you can interact with the blockchain with any blockchain right out of the command line. Yeah. So if you have an RPC URL and a private key, you can use Cast to send transactions to call transactions from the blockchain. You can read blockchain data and you can basically do anything from your command line. And you don't even need to have a Foundry project initialized. That's Cast. Okay. And Anvil. Uh, this is the third. CLI tool that, that is shipped along with Foundry. So if you've used Hard Hat or Truffle before, uh, you must have seen that uh, they come with a local testnet along with their frameworks, right? I think Truffle's testnet is uh, called Ganache. Hard Hat's testnet is called Hard Hat Node. And like in an equivalent fashion, Foundry's local testnet is called Anvil. We'll look into Anvil a little more uh, at the end of the workshop. So these are the three tools and what next? Yeah, so if you have Foundry installed, you should run Foundry up and everything should work. So when you run Foundry up, basically Foundry queries the GitHub repo and sees if there's a new release and it'll just update everything every time you run this command. Okay, I'll take a look at the chat to see if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, we got one question from Hardik, which is, I don't know if you know, but who is using Foundry in production right now? Do you know any projects? Me personally, no. Like this will have to be taken by someone else. Okay. I don't know, but it just came out last year and there are already a bunch of improvements from a DevX perspective. I feel that a lot of protocols will start using it in 2023, which makes this a good time to learn about Foundry. Cool. We're still early. Still guys. <laughs> yeah, we're still early. Okay, so let me just quickly go over what we'll be doing in this workshop. Right. So the idea for this workshop is to give you an overview of Foundry, right? Not to test your solidity skills. So we'll be working with a very simple ERC20 smart contract using Open Zeppelin, and we'll use Foundry to compile and test our smart contract and we'll deploy it later on. So yeah, that's really it. We'll deploy it, we'll verify it using Foundry, and I'll give you an overview of all the features of Foundry using a simple smart contract. Cool. I think we are ready to switch over to the coding part of our workshop. Okay, so once you have Foundry installed, create a random folder. Let me just, yeah. So we'll be initializing a Foundry project inside this folder. Let me just open this up in VS Code. Okay, just a second, guys. Okay, I am getting some errors. Let me close everything. Yeah. That also, this is a good reminder too that no matter how much like knowledge you build in Web three, you you're gonna keep running into errors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So I have my terminal ready now. Okay. So if you have Foundry installed, the way to initialize a Foundry project is just run Forge in it. Again, Forge is one of the CLI tools shipped along with Foundry. So what you can do is you can pass it a parameter as in a you know folder name. So what it'll, it'll do is it'll create a folder and inside that folder will be your Foundry project. But we'll just, we just want to create one inside this directory. So we do forge in it and we get a basic boilerplate project. Let me go over what we get very quickly. So when you run forge in it, you get a small project and these are the important files and folders. So the SRC folder contains all of our smart contract, nothing much. And the test folder contains our test contracts. The script folder contains our scripting files. We use the scripting files to deploy in Foundry. We will create a small script that allows us to deploy to the girly testnet. 
What is and, a, a scripting okay. file, Priyank? A scripting file is basically a smart contract that will, there's a function called run in Foundry. Uh, basically, if you configure it correctly, you can call that file from the command line. And when you run that smart contract inside the scripting file, your smart contract will be deployed. Nothing much. It, it's actually the simplest part of the project. I'll get to it later on. Cool. Uh, anything else? Yeah. So the way Foundry works is when you're creating a test uh, smart contract, right? Uh, by convention, you name it along the lines of name dot p dot soul, and your scripting files will be along the li lines of dot s dot soul. So what happens is, uh, so if you have a, a contract named counter dot soul, you'll create a counter dot p dot soul, and a script called dot s dot soul. This helps you in keeping track of what is what, right? But uh, like, just to be clear, it's not necessary, but it's good convention. Okay, so the lib folder. Let me just quickly show you something. Okay, so what the, uh, okay. So how Foundry manages, a dip, manages its dependencies. What it does is we basically download GitHub repos. We pass it, I'll show you how to do that in a second. So they manage their dependencies using something called get submodules. We basically we're downloading a bunch of GitHub repositories. And if you have your smart contracts in that repo, you can in, import them and use it as part of your own project. We'll be looking into this a little more further on. Foundry.toml. Okay. So every Foundry project typically has a Toml file, which you can use to configure uh, the behavior of your Foundry project right this file can have a bunch of different parameters and if you don't define anything uh, all those parameters typically have a default value that foundry will fall back to in case you don't specify anything particular in this file and if you go back to the readme that i left uh you guys and uh, uh, tom let me just yeah so if you want to see like all the configurations that foundry supports in the tom file you can go to read me and in the link that I left you, you can see a fully filled out Toml file, but it, there's a lot of stuff that we won't be going into. And this, uh, the other link is contains a bunch of default configurations that you get. So all of this stuff, it's defined by default. So if we don't define anything, these are the values that Foundry will use for all of this stuff. Okay, so looking back to any questions. If I could just jump in for a second. So for people familiar with hard hat, I guess like would you say foundry.toml is kind of like hardhat.config.js? Yes, it's the direct equivalent. Yes, that's correct. So this is it. And we can now fully go into our Yes. So to get started with our ERC20 smart contract, see the first thing that we need to do is we need to install the open Zeppelin contracts library, right? Because I'm, as I'm sure you have already done, uh, when you deploy an ERC20 smart contract, you typically inherit already pre-built smart contracts from open Zeppelin. So uh, here's the contracts library for open Zeppelin. The way this works in Foundry is so you go to your GitHub repo, the one you want to import, and you like copy the uh, part of the URL after github.com. So this points to the exact repo that we want to download. So what we'll do is we'll do forge install. And this what this will do is this will install the open discipline contracts library inside the lib folder. Let's give it a couple of seconds. Yeah. It's done. So we are now ready to get started with that contract. So go to the source folder and we'll create a contract named erc20.soul. And I think I had the contract in the readme. Yeah. Okay. So guys, this might seem counterintuitive, but what I want you to do is open Remix in your browser, right? and create the same contract. This is uh, this will make sense moving on. 
Trust me, go to Remix, create an ERC20 dot soul contract. And let me compile this and deploy it to the virtual machine, right? And everything should be there, right? That's it. Like keep do this, keep it at the side, and we'll get back to this later on. Now, moving back. So we'll have the ERC20 file in Foundry also, and we paste our code in there. What you'll notice immediately is Foundry can't make sense of our imports. Like what the hell is going on here? Uh, yeah. So what's happening here is Foundry doesn't know where exactly we're getting our imports from. So we need to tell Foundry exactly where to look. When we say open zip in, what do we mean by that? Which folder are we referring to? Right. So Foundry has this concept called remappings. They call this. So if you run forge remappings, I think, yeah, I made a spelling error. So forge remappings. What this does is, as you can see, see, there's this thing called forge FTD, the forge standard library. You can see there's this definition of a path, uh, the lib folder, for JSTD, the source folder. This is uh, a way of referencing where our dependencies lie. So we'll need to define uh, an open zeppelin. What do we call it? We, we need to define a path to our dependency like this. So run for G mappings. Uh, just let's see. For G mappings remappings.txt okay. so what this will do is this will take all of these dependencies right that exist by default and foundry will create a file called remappings.txt and it will put these remappings in there so we can define a new remapping in this file so what we're going to do is we're going really to quick, Priyank, could you yeah. just explain for everybody um what like the remappings just are like outside of the the code itself real quick uh, uh i'm sorry what outside of the code as in or, or, or sorry just explain what remappings are in like a like gen generic way okay so okay generic way or a foundry remappings is nothing more than a way of referencing the exact path so what we're doing is uh we're going to tell foundry by creating a new remapping and what this remapping will do is it'll just tell Foundry where to look for uh, something called open zeppelin. So we call this open zeppelin. And what do we mean by that? We'll define a new path for it. And this this is basically a remapping, nothing else. A way to specify a particular path. That's it. So our new remapping will be along these lines. Let me just copy it from the readme. Uh, configure remappings. Yeah. Uh, don't wait. This will become clear now. Right. Okay. So guys, have a look. So what we do is we go into the lib folder and we go into open zeppelin contracts. And okay. So okay, our new remapping has been created, right? This is it. So we'll go to our imports and will cut this out. If you see, we are already specifying our, specifying our path up till the contracts folder, right? So our erc 20soul smart contract, for example, if you go into open Zeppelin contracts slash token, where is it? Just a second. Contracts, okay. So you go to contracts, you go to token, cancel, sorry. Token ERC20, ERC20 dot soul. This is the exact path for our contract that we're inheriting, right? So what we'll do is we created a new remapping. Uh, just a second. Open zip then. Contracts. What? Okay, I messed up. Just a second. And this is it. This should work. Okay, ERC20 dot burnable. I think I made a mistake while copying stuff. 
just a second. So burnable dot soul that was contract slash token slash ERC20, right? Yeah, this works now. So what we did is we told Foundry that whenever we're importing something, when we say open Zeppelin slash, this is the path that you should start looking into. So what we uh, do here is when we say open Zeppelin slash import open Zeppelin slash, Foundry automatically opens the lib folder, goes into open Zeppelin contracts and opens the contracts folder. This is where uh, we reach uh, to the credit of our remapping. And after that, it's the same thing. Yeah, so 20, 20 dot four, it's the old path that's already been defined. So remapping basically allows us to refer to our dependencies conveniently. And if you noticed the exact path of our depend dependencies, it was common up till the contract folder, right? So instead of uh, configuring our remapping up till here, uh, just inside the dependency, we went up to the contracts folder, right? So if I didn't have the, uh, say the ownable dot soul smart contract, if I didn't need this, I could define the remapping up till the ERC20 folder, right? Which would make it even easier to import everything. Like just pointing it out. You can define the path in a way of, in a variety of different ways. Cool. So let me just quickly go over the smart contract. It's pretty basic. What we're doing is, we are creating an ERC20 contract. And in the constructor, we are just minting a thousand initial tokens to the owner of the contract. And this function uh, only uh, includes a mint function that is uh, that can only be co called by the owner. And we use the only owner modifier that comes to us from the ownable.soul smart contract. And that's it really. We don't have much else to do for this. Now we are ready to get like get into testing and stuff. But before this, like I wanna take a while to answer any questions you might have in the chat. So feel free. I'm looking into the chat right now. Yeah, we had a question basically asking uh, for remappings. They're optional right now, but is there a main reason why you'd want to do remappings over just importing directly from you know the GitHub? Okay, so you can't uh, look up into the GitHub uh, repo that's online, right? Because that's what we do with Remix. Okay, so what we do here is uh, when we say at the rate open Zeppelin, Remix knows what we're looking into. We're looking into this specific dependency. Now, when we download this repo into our libs folder, we need to define a remapping to like tell Foundry that, hey, you need to look into the libs folder, right? In the library folder. So we need to define, like it's crucial to define the remapping at least till the exact folder the dependency rests in. Mm. This contract folder was optional, but you have to define the remapping at least up till the open Zeppelin contracts path. Gotcha, like the rest so it's of not it, optional. No, no, it's not, but like you can configure it in a variety of ways that's optional mm -hmm. cool anything else okay that's clunky syntax import libs yeah you can do that or you can just directly import it calling lib slash open zeppelin but it i think it's good to go over a feature if it exists no uh real quick priyank we had another question that popped up it uh -huh. was uh so we can't do import uh, straight from like the lib tag. It can't reference that. <laughs> okay, so this is going to sound funny. I have actually never tried this. I've tried remappings, but I've never imported it directly. Let me just try it out live. So what we can do is, let me just take this out real quick. Lib slash. Let's go into open Zeppelin contracts slash contracts and let us see if this works yeah it works you don't actually need a remapping but yeah <laughs> i just showed you that if you need a remapping that is how you do it gotcha okay so yeah just to clear that up there it is optional you can pull straight from lib but uh 
do it the clean way. It's more fun. You'll learn yeah. more. Your imports have shortened now. Why not? Okay. So if you have followed up till now, you see the errors are gone. Foundry knows where to look. Okay. And yeah, uh, as Hardik says, any GitHub link. Yeah, for install, you can clone any repo into your lib, lib folder. That's right. So to compile your smart contracts, you have to forge build, nothing more. And uh, Foundry will see if there's any contracts that were created or edited uh, since the last forge, forge build command. If you run again, it'll tell you that no files have been changed. So I'm skipping compilation. Cool. So that's it. The smart contract is pretty simple. Now we can get started with testing, right? So, okay, so very quick. So we'll cover two types of testing here. Uh, the first one is uh, unit testing. We'll just run a bunch of tests and see if they pass. The second thing is first testing, where Foundry will pass a bunch of parameters to our functions. And like it'll try to get our function to fail. And then we can look at it and see what happened, what we can do to make it better. That's it. So to get started with testing, create a file named erc20.tk.soul inside the test folder. So there's a bunch of concepts for testing. Let me just go with them real quick. Okay, so whenever you're testing a smart contract in Foundry, you need two things. First of all, what you're doing is you're basically creating another smart contract, right? So the first thing you need to import is the actual smart contract you are testing. So counter.t.soul is testing counter.soul. So that's what it's importing. And the second one, this is what Foundry offers us as part of its testing suite. Uh, you can open this. This test.soul smart contract comes to us from the Forge standard library. And this is basically a superset of all these smart contracts. This is what we use to enable testing and do a bunch of things that will go over. So to start testing, you need to import the test.soul smart contract. Where was I? and the smart contract you're actually testing. And again, so this is a remapping that we had, if you noticed. Again, this shortens the import path. Instead of this, you just call forge std, and that's it. So to test our ERC20 smart contract, I'll go to the readme. Uh, so and I'll copy everything. I'll go over this, uh, like, I'll take my time here. Okay, so don't worry. Uh, this is a bunch of code. Uh, 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 everything should work. Cool. So to begin testing, we imported our ERC20, ERC20 smart contract, and we imported the test.soul contract. We create a smart, this can be anything. We just give it this name, ERC20, ERC20 test, and we, inherit the test.soul smart contract, right? So uh, then we write a bunch of test functions and a few things to note here. So first of all, uh, when you want to run uh, tests in Foundry, the command is forge test. And when you run this, Foundry doesn't, does not, let me make this clear, Foundry does not go into the test folder and run all of the functions as tests. No, Foundry will go through the entire directory and it will look for any functions in any smart contract that begin with the string test. Let me make this a bit more clear. So when uh, we have function named test name, Foundry will see if any function begins with the string test. So Foundry will uh, test the function called test name, but just for the heck of it, if we call it name test, Foundry will not test it. Right, so it needs to be test name because that is how Foundry identifies it as a function that needs to be quote unquote tested. Right. So whenever we are testing with Foundry, okay, so the function set up, yeah, I almost forgot. See, uh, what happens is uh, while testing Foundry runs each and every single test function separately in a separate VM instance. So these functions are technically not related to each other. But uh, each function will need access to our smart contract, right? To access all of the variables and the functions that we're testing. 
so we declare a new instance of our uh, smart contract in here okay by the way my token so our file is named erc20.soul but the name of our smart contract is my token so that's what we're uh, initializing here we're in initializing a new instance of that smart contract so what this function setup does is foundry runs this function before each and every single test function so if you have uh, five test functions this function runs five times before every test function so that each test function has like access to an instance of our smart contract that's it and then we have a bunch of global variables okay so the owner thing so while uh, testing this uh, thing out like uh, making content for the workshop uh, what i saw is when we run forge test foundry deploys everything to an artificial environment right so uh, the owner every time foundry deploys a smart contract this is the specific address that's set as the owner of a smart contract so i just hard coded it in there let's not do this and i expect it to give us errors okay balance of owner let me just i'll go over this in a bit okay uh, and one more error we have not start crank here again i'll do this okay okay so before we start running tests let us go back to remix or even if you don't have this open it's okay let me just be okay so uh, what i do is i deploy my smart contracts on remix and it gives me a neat list of all the functions that i have right so this owner thing is basically it returns to us the owner of our smart contract of our erc20 smart contract and it's basically a function nothing more and you have a bunch of other functions too like symbol or decimals decimals just returns to us the number 18 and the significance here is like one eth equals to 10 to the power 18 way 10 to the power 18 yeah that's it it tends to 10 to the power 18 way and uh erc20 just gives us access to this function called decimals that we can call directly so for example when we were minting our smart uh when we were minting the initial tokens we called in the decimals function to uh mint 10 to the power 18 into thousand number of tokens because uh, we mint in v units not each units that's it okay so whenever like this is a simple test function right it begins with the string test again you need to do this or else foundry will not recognize this as a test function mm -hmm. right you create a string called name okay i don't know this okay this is old so what we do is we call the function name and if you have remix open you can see the name it should return to a foundry token because that's what I named our token, right? So this is a bit outdated, I guess. I forgot to update my test. Just let me while you're this. while you're updating that real quick, uh, uh -huh. for those who missed it, the foundry syntax forces you to put test in front of your function name, which is really handy because one, it makes it really clear to see where your tests are for each function in your main solidity contract and uh like we've been saying in the chat it really cleans up the formatting for your test too um for any of you guys who have been doing like the solidity tutorials this should seem really really familiar at least in like what the actual keywords you're looking at are versus the <laughs> uh, javascript version in hard hat which is you know big number assertions and uh, a lot of abstracting mm -hmm. to get to that right yeah so i'll pause here and i'll go through the chat there are a bunch of good questions here okay so uh let me just yeah okay so open zeppelin contracts isn't a foundry repo as i know right open zeppelin contracts that you use in a typical hard hat project it's an npm package basically we are not using npm here we're directly cloning a specific GitHub repo, right? It's not NPM, nothing to do with NPM. Cool. So yeah, anything else? Uh, yeah, so uh, JavaScript doesn't have 
denotypes like u into 56, right? And when you're writing tests in solidity, you get the advantage of no, like you don't have to switch to another language and everything feels a bit more uniform. What the hell is a prank? Okay, I'll get into that. Prank <laughs> is what they call cheat code. Uh, I'll get into that in a moment. It's it's very cool, really. Uh, no ethers, JS, nothing there. No, we don't. Okay, so ethers, JS. So I don't know if they use that. I don't think they can use it uh, behind the scenes even because it's written in Rust, right? So I don't think there's any ethers, JS involved. Hardhat uses ethers, JS, and I think Truffle uses Web three JS, if I remember correctly. All the time. <laughs> We'll go over that. Ethers RS. Yeah, I have heard of Ethers RS, but I'm not familiar with it. This is how forks are made. Okay, so I don't see uh, what you mean, Lucky Monkey. From hard hat to foundry. Okay, Lucky. Uh, foundry was built. Uh, anything else? Any question? Uh, okay, so I guess we're on top of everything. I'll again, I'll quickly go over the test that we're doing. Let me go over everything line by line. So I create uh, the first thing I do is I create two global variables. Uh, these are two indexes. So what happens is I this is a very simple uh, this uh, when we wrap something like this inside the address data type, this will create an uh, a typical Ethereum address a hexadecimal address. So uh, what this will do is alpha will have the value of 0x, 0, 0, 0, and however number of zeros you have in an Ethereum address and one. Basically, this is what it represents, a very simple Ethereum address. And again, we, we create two addresses called alpha and beta, and we'll they'll be more, uh, like you'll understand what I mean by them when we go with prank. Cool, so uh, that's it. So test name, uh, when we, in a typical test function, you want to assert something, right? That's what you're testing. Hey, uh, when I test this particular function, this is what I expect to get back in return. And if this is not something I'm getting back in return, then the function fails, right? So Foundry gives us a bunch of assertions. Uh, assert equal is the one that I've used the most. And what in this function, what we're doing is we are calling the function name. And again, you can look at Remix. We have a function called name and we expect it to return to us this string foundry token. And if this fails, if this string doesn't matches with name, then our function will fail, right? Uh, and this is it. And decimals returns 18 as we saw before. The symbol was FTK. Again, this file is a little outdated. FTK and right. Uh, let me, uh, one more thing. So Foundry doesn't just give us access to like some assertions, but we also have a bunch of utilities. So what console does is, uh, console two or uh, you don't even need to use this. So there are two smart contracts, console and console two. Typically the rule is if you don't want your project, if you don't have a need for your Foundry project to be hard hat compatible, you use console two because there were two smart contracts that enabled logging. Console two is a slightly updated version, but this is not compatible with hard hat. But since we are not using hard hat, I'll just use console two. Dot log and this logs anything that I want shown in my terminal. And in this function, we are not even testing anything, right? So the idea is you don't need to make an assertion, but if you want to make sure that something, you know, you want to log something, uh, Foundry will just run this function again. Uh, if your function begins with the string test, Foundry will run it as a test, even if you're not asserting anything. And talking about assertions, Foundry has a bunch of them. Uh, let me think, std assertions, assertions, assertion functions. I think this is it. Pathfinder or standard. Yeah, I think this is it. So these are the assertions that are shipped to us by default. But only using the assert equal, we don't need anything else. But if you feel the need, 
if you feel like you want to take a more detailed look, you can go into the foundry docs and have a look there, right? So any other function? Yeah, start prac. Okay, this is really cool. So what happens is uh, whenever you call any function, anything, uh, we're calling uh, the balance of function, the owner function, anything, uh, control Z, quit. Yeah, uh, Foundry calls everything from the perspective of the owner. So uh, whatever con uh, like whatever address is the owner, uh, Foundry calls the function from that perspective. So all of the functions will be accessible to us, right? But as you recall, our minting function was only owner. So only the owner should be able to call this. But how do we make sure? The like way to do this is call this function by impersonating someone else. Uh, so if you call this function from an address that is not the owner, the function should revert. And again, you go to ownable.soul. If you go into this contract, you'll see only owner, check owner. Okay, so this is right. So if you go into only ownable.soul, you'll see the, uh, okay, what was that? Only owner mod modifier is basically a function that says, hey, uh, you can access this function only if you are the owner, right? Otherwise, I'll give you an error with this string. So we copy this string, we go to our test, and we tell Foundry, hey, uh, like start prank, start a prank. And what this prank does is, we pass it a parameter called alpha, which is one of the random addresses that we defined above. So what Foundry will do is, after you have started a prank, till the time Foundry sees the stop prank, prank functions, all of the calls uh, between these two, they'll be called from another address, right? From uh, like this address called alpha. So Foundry will uh, return to you uh, everything as if it's the alpha address that, that called everything. So we expect this function to fail, right? We expect it to fail. So what we do is we call a cheat code Foundry calls it a cheat code, expect revert, and there are a bunch of them actually. Let me just assertion cheat codes reference, expect revert. Yeah, so uh, within the cheat codes reference, there are a bunch of uh, assertions you can call. So what expect revert does is we say, hey, we expect our function to fail with the following error, like this exact error. And if the function like reverts with this error, then a test function passes. And that's all. That's what pranking does. Uh, the test meeting two, and this is nothing. Uh, what we do is you don't you don't even need to prank here because uh, the function will be by default called as if it's the owner, right? It's unnecessary. So what we're doing is the test minting to function. We are minting some tokens to this address called beta, and we're logging the balance of this address beta. If you want to make it a proper test, you can. What you can do is assert equal, and we can make this like this. We say the balance of the address beta should be equal to ten to the power eighteen. And that's it. You. And earlier I was just log logging it, so I didn't assert anything. Get into the power 18, I made a mistake here, and it should work. Okay, uh, we can quickly run this. So when we run forge test, what Foundry will do is it will go to go through every smart contract, right? And every function that begins with the string test, it'll, it will run that. But let's make it a little better. So we can pass it a parameter called match path and what we'll do is we'll tell foundry hey do not test any files that are not relevant to me at the moment specifically counter.t.soul uh, i want you to test this exact file which is under the test folder and it is called erc20.t.soul test all the test functions within this file so the advantage here is if you have a bunch of smart contracts if you have a bunch of tests it might uh, like quicken up the process because if you don't do this, Foundry will go through each and every single solidity file, which is just a bunch of work and it will take time. So we pass it this parameter and what we can also do is, yeah, 
So there's this thing called verbosity, which basically means how much detail you want. Uh, we can pass this flag called V. And what this will do is if we pass it three Vs, in fact, let me just show you. So we uh, call this function. We, we ran this test on this specific file and we can see all our functions pass, right? And uh, whatever we are logging, Foundry will give us that. So for the test balance function, apparently I'm logging things. Okay, so I'm logging the number of tokens that the owner has because the balance here, the balance variable here records the balance of our ERC20's owner. And again, the balance of function comes from our ERC20 contract balance of it takes a parameter, it takes an address as a parameter. And ERC20.owner, again, the owner function returns to us an address. So we are passing this address to this function. Hopefully that makes sense. So we're logging that balance and we're getting that log here. And we're just logging the owner of the contract. So ERC20.owner gives us the owner of the contract. And this is the address that I was logging here. If you can see. Address really quick. Order. Um, Priyanka, yeah. we have a couple of questions in chat that I think would be really good for this section. Yeah. So uh, going back, um, really quick, since we're already at the address section, uh, we had someone ask earlier, are we updating the address owner to equal our address? So then that comment you made, uh, the one line, if you go to the top okay. of their test. Yeah. So when you run forge test, uh, this is the, uh, this is the address that will be the owner every single time. So I just hard coded it, but you don't have to like every time you run ERC20 dot owner, every time you run forge test, this is the address that will be the owner. So I was just hard coding it, nothing else. Gotcha. And then. Really cool question um, from Lucky. He asked, does the function have public and private properties when we're testing them here? Uh, okay, uh, sorry, what? Go again. So when we're testing these functions out, do these functions in the test, are we able to test if they have public and private properties too? Okay, so you want to tell, okay, so what happens is, uh, if we want to import anything into this smart contract, right, uh, in this ERC20 test, everything has to be public because otherwise you can't import it into an, another smart contract. These are typical solidity rules, nothing to do with Foundry. Mm. And again, I think uh, if we change this function to private, for example, I am not sure. Okay, just if we change <laughs> this to private, I am not sure, but... If I remember correctly, Foundry does not test this function because Foundry doesn't have access to it because the function is private. We can quickly check that out. Uh, earlier, we had six functions that passed, right? Uh, let me just run this again. Okay, so, so apparently it can, so my bad. So it does not matter if we have private, if you have functions private or public here, but to imp import your like smart contracts, the function in your base smart contract, they need to be public. Mm. So that's it. And anything else? I think the don't you, have to, is... don't you have to forge build before running the forge test again? No, uh, no, the contract is already compiled. So we don't gotcha. need to do forge build. Anything else? Can we test private functions or not? No unit tests for private function. Yeah, had a good point. Actually, that is a limitation. We should be able to test private functions too, you know. But, uh, I guess that's it. I did didn't know actually. Hard hat has the same limitation. So, okay, so uh, build just builds the contracts. Doesn't do anything with tests. Yeah, build just compiles the contracts. Nothing else. That's it, guys, for the testing thing. Okay, yeah. So I also want to go over first testing. That is really, really cool. Uh, Hardhead does not have first testing. Last I checked. So this is really cool that a mainstream framework supports it. So you can create another file. Or you can also like just create a first function within the same file, but why not create a separate file? I'll call it yes, 20 first dot t dot soul. 
and it does the same thing. Okay, so does my I'm not sure if I pushed it to the repo. Okay, so okay, guys, my bad. So what happened is I created a first test, but I forgot to push it to my repo. I'll push it later on, but for now, let me just go over this. I'll go into test first.t. So let me just copy everything. The notepad. I'll go back and I'll copy it in there. Okay. This is what a typical first test will look like. Uh, you're already familiar with everything else. Let me just go into this thing. So in fact, we'll comment this out. I'll tell you why. We have rebalance also. Good. Okay. Oh, now we're ready to get started with first testing. Okay. So what first testing is, first of all, you create a function, a test function, the typical way, right? Prefix it with the string test. But unlike other test functions, for a first test, you just need to pass a parameter to a regular test function. See, if you go back, you'll see I did not pass any parameters to the test function itself. Right, so you pass a parameter uh, to the test, uh, the fuzzing function, and what you do is amount, amount, amount. So, for example, we just, yeah, so uh, there's this thing called transfer, right, within ERC20. Transfer, transfer is uh, when you want to transfer a specific number of tokens from one address to another, a typical ERC20 uh, function. So we want to make sure, hey, if I transfer this many tokens, it works. But will the function work if I transfer a different amount of tokens, right? I want to vary the amount of tokens I transfer using my transfer function. So instead of passing a random value, you know, hey, just test this function with this value. No, I'll say no, uh, like pass a variable called amount. And what Foundry will do is it will run this function by default, uh, the value is 256 times. Foundry will run this function 256 times with different values for this variable. And uh, Foundry will tell us if, the, if our function fails for any specific value. Hopefully that was clear. Amount, let me check. Yeah, I'll go into this uh, like in a moment, but I'll, our test will fail and it will quickly become like you'll see why cool so forge i'll just erc20 false dot t dot full so let me run this okay it passed it really shouldn't uh uh, -uh the attended power okay so you can see Foundry runs this 256 times and we can configure this behavior in the TOML file. So if I have this in my readme, I don't know if I do. Let me just first. Okay, I guess I don't. But you can change this, uh, like the number of times you want to run this. So if I go to my TOML, just a minute, guys. I set this here. Five. Yeah. So we can change the number of times we want Foundry to run our tests. This is a typical example of how to use a TOML file. We go to first, 256 is the default value. We'll change this to 1000. And now Foundry will run our tests a thousand times. Okay. Now, ERC20 first dot t dot soul. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, so what we're doing is plus thousand plus amount. I expected the test to fail actually. That is why I added the assume thing. Let me just go with the prebalance plus amount. So what we're asserting here is thousand tokens were the initial amount our owner had, right? So what we're doing in this particular test is we are transferring a bunch of tokens from beta to owner. So we start rank beta transfers a bunch of 
tokens to the owner and uh, before that we are minting a bunch of tokens to beta but only owner can do that so but first we mint a bunch of tokens and then beta transfer transfers those tokens to owner and we are asserting like it's a mathematical relation nothing much that the number of tokens that we passed to our owner that's equal to the other amount uh, uh, okay so so Okay, I guess I'm missing something, but this is how you typically run a first test. So to recap, you basically pass a parameter and Foundry will vary that parameter uh, to see if your function fails, but apparently ours is passing. So this is all to do with first testing. Nothing much. So that's it for testing, guys. Now we can move on. Really and quick, again, Priyank, um, yeah. just some couple questions from the chat. Uh, yes. So just to keep, just to reiterate, on the GitHub repo, do we still have to push an update to the test folder? So that, yes. Uh, it, okay. Yes. I'll push the one fuzzing file. Good. Okay. Um, and then what do we aim with fuzz testing? Um, so basically, why, yeah, why are we covering the function from so many different variables for the amount uh, parameter? Like what's uh, the because, benefit? Uh, the benefit is that uh, you can't always think of all the edge cases, you know, what if you're testing from one perspective, but the uh, function fails for a totally different amount. So for this, uh, Foundry offers us a bunch of cheat codes, they call it. So VM, uh, VM dot is you, uh, this comes to us from the test contract, right? Uh, real quick, I'll go into test. And again, you can see import VM from VM.sol. We, you can go into this and read if you want to take a more detailed look. ERC20.first.sol. So we, what VM.assume, what this specific function does is, see the um, uh, like our parameter amount. What if uh, we want to limit the variation of this parameter within a certain, uh, you know, like within a certain bound. So what we can do is we can say, hey, like, I know my test will fail for this particular value. So how about Foundry, you keep the value of amount less than this particular value. And this particular value is beta prevalence, which is basically the amount of tokens beta has. So for example, here, if we transfer a bunch of tokens from beta to owner, the test will obviously fail if we try to transfer an amount that is greater than what beta already has, you know? So if you have $10, you can't give someone $20 because you don't have it. So we're telling Foundry, hey, we already assume that we're transferring an amount less than the balance of the user. So just keep that in mind. So again, I'll comment this out. Basically just Foundry runs this a bunch of times, nothing much. Cool, so that's it for testing, right? So we can get started with deploying. Really quick, uh, right. Priyank, um, uh -huh. can we do time scheduled commands? Lucky's asking. Uh, time scheduled as in? So it, I'm guessing, Lucky, if you want to reiterate, yeah. but I'm guessing what you're saying is um, like we're testing whether or not something happens on a certain condition or after like a certain amount of time passes or like tests like that. Okay, so yeah, so Solidity does allow us to like time lock functions. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't done any testing related to like time locking and stuff. So I can't really help with that. But I guess Foundry must have it. They have a bunch of utilities. So if you want to test it. Okay, I, I don't think, have it. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think Foundry does have cheat. I think like hard hat has these things where you can kind of like skip over certain block numbers. So like mm -hmm. when you're running tests in hard hat, when you run the test, obviously, like, first of all, it's going to happen in block number one. Um, and then you can, in your tests, you can have these commands like hard hat dot move block number. And like, for example, like move from block one straight to block 1000. And I think Foundry right. has equivalent cheat codes. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you have like a staking contract, for example, where you need to make sure that 10 blocks right. later, 
this is how much stake you should get back. I think there's a cheat code to like skip over 10 blocks and then pretend like it's 10 blocks later. Right. So like this prank thing is similar, right? We are uh, like pretending as if we are coming from a certain address. So what Hardik is talking about is like uh, for hard hat, you have these utilities, right? Like move block and whatever. Foundry cheat codes are the equivalent for that. So I don't really know that Foundry offers this, but I'm quite sure they do. They have a lot of utilities. So if you want to take a look, I think I've linked the Foundry book in my repo a bunch of times. Like go through it like and go to the cheat codes reference. They have a bunch of things here, utilities, snapshots, and like you can see if they offer this time locking thing. I'm quite sure they must, but I haven't gone through it. So I don't have that right now. Cool. So like finishing with testing, let's quickly look over how we deploy and verify a smart contract with Foundry, right? So what I need you to do is go to your terminal and type touch.env. Uh, yeah, what this will do is this will create an env file at the root of your smart contract, right? And here's where we can like define all our variables. So what we do is we need an RPC URL to connect with the blockchain, right? And we need a private key to sign transactions. So whenever we're deploying to a live contract, we need an RPC URL, we need a private key. And additionally, since we are verifying our contract, we need to like just quickly go over to Etherscan and you'll need to sign in. Let me just sign in. And you'll have this thing called API keys. Just generate an API key over here and you can like delete it after on. It'll be valid as long as you have it in there. Go to an API key and I'll show you how to use it. I think I have it in my notepad. Readme.md. I'll copy this. Okay, guys, before we get too excited, this is from a burner wallet, so it doesn't really matter. If you have the private key, you'll find nothing in there. And I'll delete this node after the workshop. But okay, so Matthew, can we link a couple of uh, like RPC URLs in the chat for people to have access to the Goldie node? Yeah. Um, this is the one that we created earlier this week, right? Uh, right. So I have, think I have a bunch of working in my sandbox. Just a second, guys. Yeah, go ahead and share that over and we'll cr uh, close it out after the end of the workshop. So right. Uh, let's show them really, really quickly too how to walk through setting right. up how a chain stack that if they wanted to. Stack but mode, right. We're going to give right. you guys uh, a free API for the, for the hour, <laughs> a free node to work <laughs> off of. Right. So guys, what Chainstack does is see when you're deploying a contract, you need an RPC URL, right? So you can use a public one, but like if you're building a contract and you want a dedicated node, you want reliability, you go for a provider like Chainstack. What you can do is you create an account and you have a bunch of projects. These were created by my colleagues, a lot of them. So I have this called Triunk. So you call, create a project and within that project, you can connect to any blockchain. And by the way, we recently launched subgraphs. You can, so you can deploy subgraphs on our infra now. But I won't go into this. Let's just focus here. So you create a network. I will, uh, you can join anything. So I select Ethereum and I go to Gurley and I can like create a network. And within this network, I can create multiple nodes, right? So if I have, I want like three different RPC URLs for my three different projects, I can create three girly nodes within a project. I already have this. So what I'll do is I'll add a node here and let's, let me just quickly go over these types. You know, these were really confusing to me when I started out. Okay. So we allow you to host two types of nodes. One is elastic and dedicated. Elastic is a node that has already been deployed and you along with uh, a few other people, we cap the number of people that have access to a particular node. You will still have reliability, but a elastic node is basically where you get an RPC URL to an already existing node that you can start using from the get go. A dedicated node on the other hand 
we like you reach out to our support we spin up a dedicated node and nobody else except you will have access to that right it will be your own personal node and nobody else will be able to call or send transactions from that that's the difference and we offer two modes but not every node has an archive mode available for it a full node is basically where you have a bunch of uh, blocks available so for example for girly i think for a full node we have the uh, most recent 128 no uh, blocks available so you can query data up till you know the la uh, the most recent 128 blocks but if you want uh, if you have a contract that requires like calling data from a very old block you need to deploy an archive node All right that's it and we have a bunch of apis on it you can turn them on or off and debug trace apis they come with okay so they come with uh, those execution clients aegon and get we you can choose to enable them off or on we offer you private hosting too but i guess you need to go yeah. to support maybe uh, for that maybe nick uh -huh. um nick if you're still here do you want to just do a quick like 30 second blurb about kind of the features that chainstack offers yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Hopefully my audio is still coming in. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. So I guess from the, uh, the chain stack point of view, so we, we try to be web three and decentralized infrastructure for all. Uh, so if you want to just, I'm not sure who's running the screen here. Maybe you could just go to the general website at chain stack. We'll start there for the, the folks on the call. So you can hit us up on chainstack.com. What I like to show, first of all, is obviously our product set. So if you hover over the products, you'll see the list of protocols that we support um, on the left. I guess docs is great, but just under a product. So we'll start here. So you can see the chains. Obviously, we support a lot more than what's uh, just you know listed on this list. I think we have almost 20 blockchains today. So like we talked about, you know, Matt's here from the Polygon side of things. We've got colleagues on Avalanche. And essentially, we try to cover all the top 20 chains. We're trying to add as many as we can. So as chain agnostic, if we could use that type of terminology, it's not very easy uh, in terms of adding chains on scale and obviously providing an enterprise grade service. So although there's thousands of blockchains out there, we're probably not going to ever offer all of them, but we'll try to offer, you know, the hottest and the top chains that are coming. So, you know, a little bit of alpha like Aptos is coming, Optimism is there, you know, we're adding some of the really hot topics that are coming through. From the platform here, you can check on our pricing page and you'll see how the different plans set up. And so what we're showing off today here from the console is probably a mix between our developer and growth tiers. So for anybody looking to develop in Web3, uh, you can start with our free developer tier. As you can see, we talked about elastic nodes and full nodes. Uh, so it gives you 3 million requests per month on an RPC call. That's probably plenty for you to get started with if you're doing any of these kind of courses, you're doing any development and testing. The next group up is the growth plan that gives you access to up to three nodes. So in that case, you could have an Ethereum mainnet, a Polygon mainnet, and maybe an avalanche or any of the chains that you're interested in, you get a little bit more requests. So 20 million per month. Uh, and then we can actually open up the concept of archive nodes. So if you're doing anything in terms of, you know, blockchain history blo uh, back to Genesis block, um, you can see, yeah, if you want to zoom out just a little bit there, we'll see if we can uh, get a little bit more on the screen. Yeah, perfect. So you can see here, we do 20 million per month on elastic full mode and uh, 3 million in archive. As you grow through, the cool thing is with Chainstack, you can evolve and essentially adapt to what your needs are from the project side. So you'll get to our business tier, which gives you access to 10 nodes. We then open up debug and trace APIs, which are quite exciting. That gives you access to a lot of the blockchain data that's behind the scenes. Uh, we do offer an enterprise tier as well as you start growing into the high volume plans and even custom plans. So I personally support a lot of our clients from starting from growth, moving into developer, uh, sorry, you know, starting developer, moving into growth, business and enterprise. We also have custom tiers um, and you'll see some of the other products that we're launching this year are the subgraphs. If uh, you want to pull up the, the product page again. So some of the most exciting things are subgraphs. Uh, we're launching IPFS storage in the new year as well, which is going to be amazing. So we feel that blockchain nodes and infrastructure go side by side decentralized storage. And then some of the other exciting points that we spoke about a bit at the conversation initially was Avalanche subnets, which are app chains or subnets, uh, Polygon supernets, which are the equivalent from the Polygon side of things. We're doing a lot of work on BNB to be able to launch a new app chain project there. And then StarkX or ZK rollup kind of app chains is going to be coming very soon. So there's an amazing roadmap at Chainstack. We're here to support anybody from start to you know full grade enterprise. I'm happy to set you guys up with a trial if you're interested in some of the bigger tiers. And at least to get started, feel free to give us a shot on the developer plan. 
Uh, hopefully that's a bit of an overview, but uh, you know, Matt, feel free to fill in any of the blanks that I would have missed. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Um, sorry for the little blurb, guys. I know that's <laughs> a little outside the realm, but I wanted to give you guys an overview since we're talking about it. Uh, but yeah, Priyank, you want to get back to the, the notes? Yeah, that was a really good introduction, Nick. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, let me just... Okay, so one thing, Matthew, I can't see my Zoom control panel. It's invisible from my screen. Right, How do we gotcha. open that? Uh, go to the top. Okay, I got it. Got it. Cool. Escape button. That worked. So I'm pasting this RPC URL. You don't need to go anywhere. This is a girly RPC URL and it'll work. And I'll show you how to use that in a second. So let me just go back to my code. So touch.env, you create an env file. Uh, again, this is, everything is detailed in the readme, right? I like put in work to make sure it's as convenient as possible. Let me just okay. Yeah, here's uh, like you can copy this and then you can fill it with data as you go. Uh, I'll pause here for a minute to allow you to get everything set up. So for the RPC URL, you paste the one I gave you. For the private key, you go to MetaMask and get this done. For Etherscan, you go to Etherscan and generate an API key. After that, you save the env file. And let me share. Yeah, you save the env file and you do source.env. This command will load all these env variables into your terminal. And that's it for now. I'll take a break for a minute and I'll see if there are any questions that need answering. Great. Okay, Matthew, do you have any questions that need answering? I'm scrolling up the chat. I'm looking through it too. Uh, it seems pretty good for the most part. Uh, I know people were going and documenting how Hardik put in the uh, different references for Forge that let you uh, go 20 blocks ahead right. or 20 blocks behind, which is really cool. Right. Uh, but yeah, uh, if anyone has any questions that they didn't think got answered well enough, feel free to put them back in the chat now. Okay. So again, I'm waiting for everyone to get the env files set up. Do we need um, the fuzz test file as well, or just demoing? Uh, How do we get do we need the API? as well, or just demoing? Okay, guys, that's on me. I should have pushed it before. I forgot to do it. So technically, you don't even need to create a separate file, right? You can just copy that function into that already existing uh, test file. Uh, after this workshop, I'll push it on as soon as I can. So you'll have it for reference later on. And again, everything's in the readme. So you can follow through this workshop at your own pace. How do we get an Etherscan API again? Okay. Go to Etherscan and log in and generate an API key from here. What an Etherscan API does is we can just uh, use that API key from our command line. And when we deploy a contract through Foundry, it will automatically verify the contract too. Plus each test nets, yeah. So in a similar fashion, if you go to Polygon Scan, a Polygon Scan API key will work for Mainnet and Mumbai. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Hardik. So I guess people are still getting their API keys. I'll start getting into stuff. Yeah, drop a, a thumbs up or, or something down in the chat once you guys have got everything filled out in your .env file. Okay. Oh, I guess. I, okay, guys, I'll start rushing through some stuff. We're already oh, over time. I'm sorry for taking so much of your time. Okay, so if you have the env file filled out, you basically need to go to scripts and create an erc20.s.soul. Create this file. And to deploy a smart contract, let me just co copy on the code. Any dot s dot so. And it's a quite similar to testing, just like uh, while testing, you imported the test dot soul smart contract, you import script dot soul here, and we inherit it like this. And what happens is to deploy a smart contract, 
you have to create a function run and you have to enclose a new instance of your smart contract within this. Uh, so like we had start prank for a testing, you enclose an instance of your smart contract within start broadcast and stop broadcast. What happens is we'll call the scripting file from the command line and Foundry will just run uh, like execute this run function and whatever uh, contracts are like within this start broadcast and stop broadcast, Foundry will deploy them to a live testnet or mainnet if that's what you want. Cool. So we do this and to deploy a smart contract, we, we need to just call that uh, the scripting file forge script. Okay, so just to be clear, Foundry offers us a diff bunch of different ways. We can verify an existing smart contract. We can use the forge create command, but we'll just call the scripting file right now. Real quick, so, uh, Priyank. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. So broadcast tells Foundry it's now time to talk to the real Ethereum nodes. So we're no longer in Anvil anymore when we use broadcast. No, to deploy to Anvil, to deploy to any test at any node. Uh, like this is this is related to deployment. Not oh, okay. this does not create a distinction between Anvil or a live test net. Gotcha. And I'll get to Anvil in a moment. So right. So to run a script, any script, we'll we run forge script and we pass the exact uh, scripting file that we want Foundry to run, right? So for us it is script slash yes twenty dot f dot soul. And within that, we're calling a specific contract. This is related to uh, like calling our scripting file, but we also need to pass a bunch of parameters to deploy. So we need to pass an RPC URL. And if you have your ENV file configured, you'll see we uh, de uh, defined an RPC URL like this. So we that's how you call an ENV variable, a dollar sign followed by the variable name. We call the private key. And this broadcast, okay, Foundry needs this broadcast flag because that is how it knows that we intend to deploy this smart contract. Cool. So this verify flag, if you want to verify the smart contract as soon as it deploys, you pass this verify flag, Etherscan API key again, another uh, parameter we need to pass. Uh, we pass the Etherscan API key and we turn on the verbosity to maximum to just know that everything is running fine, right? So we run this and hopefully we get everything. Okay, so guys, remember I uh, configured my Tomal file. Okay, I did not do that. Let me just, what's the, could not find contract ERC20 deploy. ERC20.s.soul. Oh, I do. Okay. Hopefully this runs. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. No run. Yeah, this runs. Cool. So it takes a little bit of time. Chain five. This is the chain ID. Girlie's chain ID is five. Just pointing it out. And I think it waits for a bunch of blocks to be confirmed. Okay, so our contract is deployed. Now it's verifying. And I'll just copy the contract name. We'll have to wait for a couple of seconds. But in the meantime, we can just go into Gurley and I'll search for my contract address. So the contract is deployed and I can see, okay, I have one block confirmation. So again, I'll wait. It takes a little time, a little bit of time to verify. Pull out your stopwatches. Let's go. <laughs> okay, I think sometimes it likes to wait for six block confirmations before verifying. It's going to take about a minute and a half or so. Okay, I did not know that. So we won't wait for that long. I'll just cancel this. But you can do that later. Uh, like it does verify uh, your contract as soon as it deploys, which is very convenient. So I just put in a way to do that. So again, you can go to the readme file and you can check everything out there. And we can, okay. So cast, 
see everything we did till now it was the forge right and again cast a ship with foundry has separate cli we can basically use it to interact with the blockchain in however manner we see fit and you can just i won't go every, go, go through everything so basically if you have an rpc url configured we can say hey i want to know what my chain id is so i do this this is what i get back and like cast is very very powerful it supports a lot of things i put in a few things that i write liked a lot so for example if we have a deployed i i deployed another erc20 contract a while ago so if i want to know hey what's the balance of a particular address right so i'll just i'll just run this command and i'll pass it in account address and i'll get that from my command line and i can also like send transactions but like to send transactions you need a private key so i'm passing a private key here and this is the contract address and i'm transferring a bunch of tokens and this is where i call the function i pass in the parameters and i give it the rpc url and it runs and i can just transfer tokens and i can interact with my smart contract from cast uh from my command line sorry and if you like uh, want to read about it more you can go to this link and you can like read everything in this reference here cool so like to wrap everything up anvil is the local test kit that the ship right so to like use anvil you just need to open a new terminal like just inside it and you like pass anvil and again anvil has uh, also has a bunch of options so what i like to do is uh, i like to run anvil block time 12 what this will do is uh, by default for an anvil test node it will generate a new block every time you submit a transaction what this will do instead is it won't wait for you to submit transactions but it will generate a new block every 12 seconds which is what ethereum does so like if you want to mimic behavior more closely or if your contract is made in such a way that you need need your blocks to be generated after 12 seconds you can play around with this and like to deploy like the same contract that we just deployed on girly this is what you'll need to do to deploy it on anvil so let me just show this i'll run alvin anvil block time 12. so it, it tells me this is basically the rpc url uh anvil is at this point just an, another blockchain with this url but this blockchain only resides on our system so to deploy the same contract on anvil we'll do for script everything is same but the rpc url see we do this uh, local host this whole 127 thing where is it yeah this is local host and we do http localhost 3545 and we just deploy it on anvil let me show you real quick i'll do this rpc url okay for private key you need a private key from anvil so by default anvil gives you 10 accounts with 10,000 ETH each. You can configure this behavior and like you can read Anvil docs to get that. But for now, we'll copy this private key and we'll go here and Anvil private key. Again, private key here. Uh, this private key refers to this specific Anvil account, nothing to do with the real world. So we'll do this. And remember, I just said that this broadcast thing, it's used to deploy it to any blockchain right it doesn't create a distinction between uh like anvil or any live testnet this is where we make the distinction by passing the rpc url so if we do this it will just deploy and okay it's take time so it tells us that on block number eight because we are uh generating our blocks every 12 seconds on the eighth block there's this contract address and then you can interact with this uh, in a regular fashion so you can use all of these cast commands uh, uh the same way but you need to pass it the rpc url that we just read about this time all right so you can use all the cast commands for this the, at this point anvil is just another blockchain and that's it guys for this workshop Woo! i hope you had a great time <laughs> Awesome. Uh, thank you, Priyank. Uh, so yeah, if anyone has any more questions, please put them in the chat now. We'll do really quickly to recap on 
kind of just some of the big yeah. topics we went over. Uh, yeah, Hardik, you have anything? Um, no questions per se at the moment, though. No. This is a really okay, nice cool. workshop. I appreciate it. I think like I've been procrastinating learning Foundry for so long. <laughs> This is this is helpful. I was always confused about what the hell these cheat codes are, but this makes sense. Awesome. Um, Elson's asking, I was trying to run the script, but I got an error asking for fork URL. That's a, a weird flag. URL. A fork URL is basically used in fork testing, but you don't need it to run the script. Uh, are you using the exact command from the GitHub readme? During forge script, huh? I did not get that. I just ran the command. Are you passing it in RPC URL? Because you need to do that. I think your RPC URL is misconfigured if it's asking for a fork URL. Yeah, it shouldn't be needed. Forking is where you fork a live network. Using your Alchemy RPC, gotcha. Um, Maybe... Okay, so RPC URL. No, okay. Uh, 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 it needs to be for URL scripting. I do not know where you're getting that error from. But if you like use our URL, it should work. Yeah, the Alchemy Maybe RPC it's... URL will work fine too. It shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, Elton. It um, shouldn't be an issue. What we'll do too, if anyone's running into repeat issues, we're going to go through the GitHub after this workshop and clean up and get you guys an up-to-date version of all the scripting and everything you need to run this. So, oh, you got it? <laughs> I think you did not put it into the double apostrophe, right? Okay, you don't recall. Yeah, that is also possible. Right. So guys, on my part, uh, only that fuzzing function, I need to push that, but everything else is up to date. And like anytime you can go through the readme if you want, that will be up there. Yeah. I don't, yeah. and if you don't run source.env, your uh, terminal will not have access to those env variables. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Right. That's a good explanation, Hardik. Anything else, guys? Any questions at all? Any doubts you have regarding this? Cheers, guys. I appreciate the, the feedback. And oh, really big thing, guys. Um, I'm going to throw in the chat right now. Here's my Twitter URL. If there's any feedback at all that you guys have on today, if we were unclear on certain steps, if you thought we should be doing this different, DM me to my Twitter. Um, I'm going to record everything I can. This is the first workshop we've done in this series. We're hoping to come back to Learn Web 3, do a ton of more content like this in the future. So if you guys have any idea or advice for us, please send it and share it over. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, and I'll do a shameless plug myself. Here's my Twitter <laughs> URL. <laughs> Anything you need, you can like DM me or like uh, you can go into our Discord. We have a Discord for our company where you can go in and interact with our employees if you have any questions and we'll probably record this and put it on youtube so you'll have this available for later on and again the github readme is always there yeah we'll have to do Change subgrapho that's... thing next that seems really interesting yeah that's a good idea because subgraph yeah subgraph see subgraph has two options the subgraph studio is the decentralized version and they have a centralized version our, our centralized version is much faster i think Again, yeah, you'll have to run your own graph nodes. That's very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, well, cheers, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity to come, Hardik. Uh, thanks for letting us host this. And yeah, if you guys have any other questions or need any more help, DM one of us on Twitter or uh, keep your eyes peeled on either our Discord. Uh, look up here. I'll, I'll drop a link to, to that too if you have any questions that are chain stack related. Uh, and yeah, we'll definitely be back and learn Web3. <laughs> yes, Great. sir. Looking forward to having you guys back. And I think after a couple of weeks or so, you know, New Year's done, people are back on the grind. It'll be fun. I look forward to seeing more. I'd love to see that subgraph workshop. I'd love to see other stuff you have to offer. And yeah, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was very helpful. And um, we'll 
send out YouTube recording to everybody who joined in late or maybe missed a couple steps. We'll send out YouTube recording. You have the GitHub. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. We'll uh, catch back up later, okay? Everybody, happy new year. We're going to end the call, all right? Yeah, hopefully. Cheers, guys. Happy new year. Happy new year. Bye-bye. Thank you.